Hello, this is Brexit Means, The Guardian's regular Brexit podcast, and I'm John Henley. The topic we're looking at this week is a big one and a fairly fundamental one. It's about the air we breathe, the water we drink, the food we eat. It's the environment. Now, the UK's membership of the EU has played a major role in our environmental protection, from wildlife protections to to energy efficiency, air pollution to marine conservation. The EU has led in pushing through vital measures to such an extent, in fact, that more than 1,100 UK environmental laws were made at EU level. According to the House of Commons Environmental Audit Committee, 80% of our environmental rules derive in one way or another from EU directives. So all of that really begs the question, what happens to all of that after Brexit? Much of it may not be easily transferable into UK law. And although the Environment Secretary Michael Gove has promised a green Brexit that will allow the UK to set global standards on everything from animal welfare to air quality, campaigners are very worried that in this bold new post-Brexit great trading nation Britain, some protections may get watered down, they may get left behind, or they may, most alarming, simply be ignored. So, what's the environmental risk from Brexit? What should we be doing to try to minimise it? With me to discuss all this are The Guardian's environment correspondent Fiona Harvey, Tom Burke, who's the co-founding director and chairman of the environmental think tank E3G and who has been advising governments and major corporations on matters environmental for more years than he would probably like to recall, and Solitaire Townsend, who's co-founder of the sustainability agency Futera, which works with governments and businesses as well. So let's start with a little tour of the table. I'd like to ask each of you in turn if you wouldn't mind to highlight one area of environmental protection where the EU has, in your view, been particularly important and influential for Britain and that might be at risk after Brexit. Fiona, should we start with you? I think we need to look at air quality uh, because air pollution is a huge problem today. Um, It's killing people, uh, it's cutting short lives, uh, it's harming our children, uh, permanently damaging Uh, our children and it's a particular problem in the UK. Um, It comes from a variety of causes. Uh, The biggest uh, at the moment are uh, from uh, cars, especially diesel cars, Mm. um, from which you get particulates which are very small pieces of soot that lodge in the lungs um, and nitrogen dioxide which is an irritant gas. Um, And at the moment uh, the UK is completely failing Uh, to live up to the standards of air quality that it it has promised in Brussels. So without that uh, ability to enforce an EU directive on the UK, it's clear that the government would do nothing. The government has already stalled many times in coming up with an air quality plan. Mm. Uh, The government has only been brought to book uh, by using... Uh, the law, um, an important uh, NGO called Client Earth, has brought cases against the government um, using its uh, EU obligations. Um, and without that commitment, mm. without that... In- and, and the enforcement behind it. Yes, yes. And, the, and the enforcement, because, you know, the government is, is fined, is currently liable to large fines. Oh, that's one worrying end. We'll be looking in a bit more detail at how that enforcement process works and what might replace it a bit later on. Solitaire, one, one particular area of environmental protection that... I was going to pick air quality as well, <laughs> because for so many of us on a daily mm. basis, we feel this. There are so many other issues around nature and environment. Um, but for anyone who's ever walked through a city or lived in a city in the UK, air quality is huge. But what I'll do is I'll, is I'll jump from air quality to water, because they're quite similar in terms of the way in which the EU works, which is around policy and principles. So we we collectively set the policy and principles around water with water mm-hmm. framework directive etc similar to air quality and then there's two crucial jobs as well that the EU does one is enforcement so checking and fining but the other is enforcing transparency so this is absolutely crucial in air quality would we even have knowledge of the poverty of our air quality if it were not for the EU rules Mm. and it's the same on the water so whilst we 
we're going to have a conversation about who polices, who oversees, who holds to account. You can only do that if you actually have the information. And things such as the Water Framework Directive and the air quality rules that come from the EU enforce transparency and the data that we all have the right to look at on these subjects. Right, so it's being part of a much bigger whole that matters there. Tom? I think the area I'd pick out is biodiversity, where, interestingly, we've been able, from Britain, to influence what happens in the rest of Europe and drive up protection, particularly for birds, in a way that simply wouldn't have happened if we'd been inside, uh, outside of the European Union, and which is now at risk. And if you think about the uh, migratory species and the way in which all across southern Europe uh, hunting of migratory species, that's our birds, by the way, that hunting of, of migratory species, the only control we've been able to exercise on that is through our membership of the EU. Now, you think about the politics of that, there are more members of the Royal Society for the Protection of Birds than there are of all of the political parties <laughs> in Britain combined, about twice as many. So I, that, that's the area for me where I think we will lose most. But as uh, Fiona and Sol Ater have said, uh, Really, it's the ability to make governments do what they say they're going to do on this biodiversity area, as well as the other areas, that's really going to matter. And it's interesting to me that the citizens of Europe, pretty well everywhere else, uh, everywhere, including in Britain, actually, have trusted Brussels to insist on the uh, implementation of environmental laws more than they've trusted their own national capitals. That's and I think they'd be that's right. Yeah. Uh, to think that now yeah. if we leave, who's going to keep our government? Well, well, that's a, that's a very good point. Let's pick up on that straight away. Um, I mean, how, essentially, how right are we to be worried uh, is the next question. I think Fiona, I mean, it is the case, isn't it, that neither the Prime Minister's Lancaster House speech in January or the Brexit white paper made much, if any, mention at all of the environment, in fact. And indeed, the white paper says that EU laws and protections in general, not just on the environment, will only be preserved where practical and appropriate. Now, given the government's trade ambitions after Brexit, does this mean that we're right to be concerned that environmental protection really isn't a top government priority? That basically, you know, that Brexit may well be red, white and blue, but it won't be particularly green. I think this is a, a real problem for the government that they haven't foreseen um, and they haven't paid enough attention to because uh, what Tom said is absolutely right. You know, the RSPB has more members than any political party. If you put together all of the members of environmental organisations in the UK, it's what, five million old people? I mean, that's a large slice of very committed uh, voters, and they're just the ones who are actual actual members. People do care about this. They care about it a lot. Um, they care about the air their ch children breathe. They care about the, the water that they drink. Uh, they care about uh, climate change. They care about wildlife. Um, people really do. They, they might not always say it's it's the top of their mind, you know, the economy and so on might come first, but people really do care about these things. And the problem is that the environment has consistently uh, been presented to the electorate as a cost. Um, we are we're, we're told about the burden of regulation on businesses. We're told about, you know, the red tape uh, that strangles farmers. Uh, we're told about all the, 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 the different hoops, the, the regulatory hoops that we must jump through. But actually, these are to protect people. Um, and the benefits are not talked about. Mm. The health benefits, the benefits to the NHS, uh, the benefits to individuals, the benefits to our quality of life, the benefits to our well-being, uh, the benefits to our children, because we're stewards of the environment. Mm. And we've seen a, an erosion of the greenness of the Tory party, uh, and I think that's unfortunate. Well, we have members of the Tory party talking about a bonfire of the regulations, don't we, after, after Brexit? Well, this is, is one of the, the strange things, because uh, within the, the, the Tory party, we've always had a sort of a, a green wing, um, in that, uh, you know, we had John Selwyn Gummer, um, now Lord Deben, he's widely regarded as, as one of the greatest environment ministers we've had, um, he was a Conservative, and we've had a, a long tradition of, of uh, green Conservatives, um, uh, and, you know, that, that that's 
quite reasonable. Mm. A lot of the conservative constituencies are quite rural and so on. You know, there is that connection there. It's in the name, isn't it? Conserving. <laughs> exactly. Conservative conservationist. You know, they're, they're not that, uh, that, that different in yeah. a way. But this particular government, we feel, is not or likely to be tempted to, um, to sacrifice environmental issues? Oh, I think it won't own up to that if that's what it, it does. And it's likely to do as much by accident as it is by design. But we've seen all kinds of uh, things that would raise alarm bells, the most significant of which is the very specific provision in the withdrawal bill that takes away the right of citizens to sue the government, mm. the f- so-called Frankovich uh, a ruling. The EU gave citizens the right to go to court, to the European court, and seek redress for damage to them that had mm. been done by failure by government to implement the laws. We will lose that mm. access very specific. And a lot of the cases that have been brought before the European Court of Justice have been to do with the environment, of course. That's, that's true. And But what's really interesting about that is, is the mechanism that works does an enormous amount of actually seeking mediation before it goes to the court. And even so, it's a very long process to go to the court. And even so, governments are given loads of opportunities before the final sanction of imposing fines are are implemented. Now that, let me give you an example of how expensive that can be. Uh, The British government ended up having to pay 400 and odd million pounds because the Irish government had failed to implement the Water Framework Directive properly. Hmm. Now it took years to get there and the British government had to pick up the tab, not the Northern Ireland government. So the consequences of failure can be a big incentive to government to get on with and and do things. That incentive is going to go. Okay, let's look now at at how things might advance. The the plan is, at least, isn't it, Solitaire, I think to kind of simply roll over um, all this environmental legislation, along with all the other EU legislation, into UK law as part of the the great, well, what used to be called the Great Repeal Bill, and now we know rather more realistically as the Withdrawal Bill. Is that going to be easy with environmental legislation particularly? Are there going to be areas that are going to be very difficult? I know Andrea Ledson, when she was uh, Environment Secretary, said she thought maybe a third of environmental legislation would be complicated. Why is that? So um, in the great rollover bill, there will be a whole set of parts of how policy is set, which is not a set of rules. It's a set of reporting mechanisms. It's a set of rectifications. It's ways to deal with problems when they've come up. How do you roll those over when you're no longer part of things such as the Chemicals Agency or the Food Standards Agency? Who does those jobs? So there's sort of great big gaping holes. There is, however, a much bigger gaping hole in what we roll over, because if there's one thing which we absolutely will not roll over, it's the Lisbon Treaty. Obviously, that's the foundational treaty of the EU. Mm. And it's in the Lisbon Treaty that principles such as the polluter should pay and the precautionary principle around the environment are held. And it's those principles that have led all the way through EU um, policy. So one of the things, irrespective of how much of the rollover of policy we get, Mm. is what is Is the the UK's principles on the environment? We don't know. Are we going to transpose them from the Lisbon Treaty? Tom, you wanted to come in. Well, yeah, I think that's absolutely right. There's no uh, evidence the government is going to actually put into law some guiding principles for the courts. But one of the things that you get out of uh, our membership of the EU is enormous amount of regulatory stability. It takes you a long time to create Uh, environmental uh, legislation, but then it's very difficult for governments in a whimsical way, as we've seen Mm. occasionally, Mm. to change it. Now, from the business point of view, that means you have certainty in the investment you're going to make. We will lose that because we're not going to have a series of action programs which give you long-run guidance to what there may be legislation on so that business is able Mm. to prepare and get ready for it and join in in a significant way. It's a whole framework. It's a whole framework Mm. that goes when you go that, but more than that, business really needs to pay attention to the fact that we're going to have, and, and Solitaire's already mentioned some of them, we're going to replace a whole lot of agencies that currently share the cost of regulating the environment. We're going to have to pay for those equivalent agencies hmm. to be built in England. And what that means is the way this government approaches things, that means business is going to be asked to pay for the additional costs. So far from business getting uh, a reduced burden 
from our uh, uh, Brexit, it's actually going to get an increased burden as it's expected to pay for the extra staff in whatever we use to replace Brexit, uh, uh, Euratom, whatever we use to replace uh, the uh, European Environment mm. Agency, all of those agencies. Well, all, all their functions all have to be replicated uh, in Britain. Otherwise, you have zombie legislation. Yeah, we'll come on to that in a second. I just wanted to ask, Tom, if we can roll back a little bit. Um, and Tom, I'd like to ask you, how... Um, where does EU environmental legislation come from at the moment? Who, where, where is it developed? How is it put into effect? Formally, it comes from uh, two sources. It either comes from the Commission, which has the right to propose legislation, or it can come from the Parliament, which can suggest to the Commission that legislation is, is proposed. Now, the Parliament is directly connected to uh, all of civil society and business, so in that sense, legislation could come from anywhere. But it can't come as a surprise, because it has to be rolled up into an action programme, which is a multi-year programme, mm. uh, which is then decided upon by ministers. So at the end of the day, the decision about whether you introduce legislation or not is taken by the political leaders of Europe. Of which we are currently and will soon no longer oh, be. And what will happen apart. is, of course, uh, we will go on wanting to trade with Europe. Legislation will not stop being made in Europe. We will have no voice in that. And the reality is, our businesses will have to conform to the requirements of that legislation. The most obvious example is in the chemical industry, hmm. where business hates above all having to have different jurisdictions with different standards. It wants uniformity across It them. wants uniformity because that lowers its costs and it lowers its need to understand exactly how to make things work. And so what they will do is conform to the European legislation, whatever our legislation says. Absolutely. It's one of the things which people often forget when we're talking about a legislative burden, is there's very few businesses who are going to cheerlead for extra regulation. But what they hate more than anything is there to be inconsistency. Because especially if you're a large business, say you're a large British business, a large European business, or a global business, mm. none of your supply chains are all constrained within one country. None of your consumers are constrained within one country. And so when you've got different rules you're having to meet in different markets, the cost burden of that is far, far, far higher than there being just a standardised across the board. And when we think about things such as microbeads in face wash, when we think about chemicals directives, this is quite intricate information that needs to be coped with in formula development, in R&D, what you're actually adding with that is a whole load of extra headaches for business mm. where you could have a standardised role. And very important point about that, if you think that somehow doing free trade agreements will get you out of this problem, mm. you have misunderstood. Because the European market is so large, mm. what's tending to happen on things like chemicals legislation is other countries are conforming their legislation on the European legislation. Simply because it's their market and it's easier for them to do it that way than... Yeah. Exactly so. So you won't be able to somehow negotiate a free trade agreement with China that avoids European legislation over which you have no say. You'll have to take account of it anyway. Um, Let's move on to how to, to the whole question of monitoring and enforcing. Now, Fiona, you mentioned at the beginning air quality. I mean, Britain is one of five European governments, I think, currently being being um, talked to by the Commission about air quality. Um, so legislation, I mean, you know, Brit we, we, EU legislation, EU environment legislation uh, uh, um, becomes UK uh, uh, environment legislation. If there is an infringement at the moment... Who does the monitoring um, and who does the enforcing? Well, um, at the moment, um, a lot of the monitoring uh, for, for various uh, uh, directives is actually done by the government itself, mm -hmm. um, according to some EU rules. Um, but then there are bodies like the European Environment Agency, which is a sort of watchdog across um, Europe, um, that um, do their, their own uh, monitoring as well. So it's there's a sort of a, a, a patchwork across different areas, and the, and if there if an if an infringement is verified, then and what is the ultimate the the ultimate sanction is the European Court of Justice. 
Essentially, yes. I mean, it doesn't need to get that far. Um, normally what happens is that the... I mean, there's always a time lag as well. So normally mm. what happens is these things take a long time, um, but there will be a, a, a sort of a... A, a censure from the European Commission mm. saying, well, oh, you know... Well, yeah, get your house in order this. or else and it'll Yes, and then the, 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 the process will kind of escalate and governments will be asked to kind of come forward with plans and so on. Mm. And domestic legislation plays an important part too. I mean, you know, the, the, these... Uh, the governments are also... Held, the, the government is also held account through the UK courts um, has been on, mm. on, on air quality. But the problem is that we don't know what will happen after Brexit. We, we don't know um, what the uh, ultimate uh, authority mm. will be. Um, we don't know, uh, you know, as Tom was saying, um, you know, we may not have the right to sue the government anymore, which would be, that would be disastrous, mm. um, particularly in environmental mm. issues, because mm. really um, we, what we've seen in recent years is that more and more um, uh, we've got progress on environmental issues coming through the courts. Uh, it's come through um, holding governments uh, to account, mm -hmm. and then the government responds by saying, "Oh well, you know, we'll, we'll improve Toughening this." Toughening so, that legislation. Yes. Yeah. So, so it's a kind of um, uh, this is becoming more like, in a sense, the the U.S. model, uh, where really, you know, decades of um, environmental uh, progress um, uh, at the national level have been done by uh, individuals and concerned groups and so on, taking uh, federal and state governments to court. Um, and, you know, Donald Trump is in the, in the midst of trying to, to dismantle us. Yes, we'll come on to him. So, I just want to ask you, that, I mean, we, do, do we have any idea what, what kind of possibilities are, are being sketched out for what will replace that, that whole sort of monitoring and enforcement mechanism will i mean will the government be relying on defa on the uk courts to sort of monitor and and enforce environmental standards and laws how i mean if brexit basically if brexit is about taking back control you know what kind of control are we talking about i, mean, I don't know is it going to be to sort of come down to some kind of environmental ombudsman and and the british courts or so uh the Swift answer to that is who knows. So there's a coalition in the UK called Greener UK, which is made up of sort of Greenpeace and the National Trust and RSPB. And actually, collectively, these uh, organisations that have nearly 8 million members. Hmm. And they've sort of come together. You know, sometimes these are organisations that don't always align, but they've come together and they've started a very simple checklist online of where we are with this sort of a red, amber, green. And when you look through the red, amber, green on water, on air quality, on on green space, on beaches. There's very little green. <laughs> There's a lot of amber, which is essentially we don't know. But across the reds, it's almost always around information and governance. And this is my biggest worry, because we talk a lot about governance. Who's going to police? But of course, you can't police if you don't know. And at the moment, when we talk about things such as air quality, we know what our air quality is because the UK is obliged to report to that, that information. to the yeah. European Commission. And to report it publicly, which means the U European Environment Agency takes a good look at it. But so does everybody from the NGOs to interested individuals. I check it. The apps that we use for air quality are based partly on that information. So one of the really worrying little loopholes in this rollover of policy mm. is... You don't have to roll over policy if you're not rolling over monitoring. So where's the information going to come from? Because if we want to take back control, then, and by the way, it's not the government who wants to take back control, it's us who want to take back control, <laughs> then I need information yeah. to know what control I have. And we may, we may damage that entirely by accident. One of the provisions of the Withdrawal Act is that in secondary legislation, i.e. effectively without parliamentary scrutiny, mm. the government wants to take the part to remove what it calls technical changes, i.e. references to institutions we'll no longer begin mm. with, except all of those institutions we report to are those sort of institutions. So now you will take out, very possibly, for instance, the need to report your carbon emissions. Well, if we don't report our carbon emissions, we can't be members of the uh, uh, carbon trading system. If we don't report... Uh, we are re required to report to the EU when we want to change the special sites, Natura 2000 sites, that are protected by the Habitats Directive. If you simply remove a reference to the need to report to the EU, 
then you don't know that you're going to be damaging your ability to manage what's happening on those sites. So it's not only that you might do things by design that weaken that or omission, but also you might do things by accident. Mm. This is actually really interesting. We talk a lot about whether we're going to be good or bad on nature and the environment. We don't talk enough about whether we're going to be blind. That's a very interesting point. So how do we feel then? I mean, Fiona, you mentioned earlier about the way that UK environment legislation has has advanced. Um, after Brexit, one of the big concerns of campaigners is this idea that, that people talk about of zombie zombie laws or zombie legislation. Can you explain a little bit about what they are? Well, this is to do with what, what we've just been mm. discussing in, in, in the sense that it, these will not really be created by design but more uh, by an accident of this incredibly complicated process where, you know, we, we've got this kind of great rollover bill and we've got these promises of continuity mm. that we will keep uh, the protections and so on. Um, but as Thomas just said, some of this is so complex. And dynamic, isn't it? I mean, the, the whole point is that this, like, lo- these laws have to constantly evolve. Yeah, they have to adapt to, to our changing you know, circumstances. I mean, you can't just kind of set a, uh, a carbon target, let's say, and then uh, just, just leave it in place. You know, I mean, we've got targets, for instance, for 2040, uh, 2050, internationally on you know, various aspects of mm. carbon emissions and so on but we need to get there um, we need steps along the way so let's take as, as an example the UK's Climate Change Act which was a, a great piece of legislation but probably wouldn't have happened had we not already uh, participated in the EU's carbon mm. uh, uh, emissions uh, uh, directives um, and the, the Climate Change Act although it has a 2050 target, actually the agency responsible for that has to come up with carbon budgets for every five years. So, so you always know about a decade ahead right. where you're going to be and they monitor that and they every year they advise the government on how well or how badly we are meeting those targets. Um, now that is very clearly defined. Um, but what does that depend on? Well, that depends on a huge number of, of other bits of legislation because um, you can't just say, well, the country is going to have emissions of such and such in you know, 2025 um, without that cascading down into an enormous number of regulations. Like, for instance, let's take building regulations, energy efficiency. How do you build a new house? How much insulation does it have to have? How do you align those very intricate regulations with the overall and, national target? And keep target? them aligned, exactly. Keep them, exactly. That's the, to, I mean, that's a very interesting point, isn't it? To, I mean, Tom, it's clearly, I mean, we're talking about a tremendously complicated kind of web of interlinked sort of information sources and policy making and, and, and legislative You know, it's an extraordinarily complex thing, but it doesn't go in one direction does it the 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 you know we're talking here about how the british environment may be affected by brexit but pollution crosses borders doesn't it the eu's environment could also be affected by brexit how concerned where where do you, do you have an idea of where the environment fits in the eu's list of priorities i mean i, I know that there there has been a call isn't there? i think there's a mention in in one of the eu's position papers on brexit for the final deal to include some kind of pledge by the UK, you know, to avoid damaging the EU environment? Well, there, well, there are two different bits to that question. Where does where does the environment fit in the EU's overall scheme of things? Absolutely at the centre. It's much higher on Europe's political agenda than it is on succession of British government's political agenda. It's seen as an issue that binds up all Europeans and therefore which is an argument for Europe to act together on, not the least because, as you pointed out, pollution, environmental effects don't observe international boundaries. So, so in that sense, that's a, a, a very important sort of thing that we lose. We lose the capacity Climate change is a very good example. We lose the capacity to, to get other European countries to do more so that our climate remains safe. And that, that for me, is a very big loss uh, in the equation. And then the second part of your question was about... Um, how, how, what, are the EU going to insist that the yeah, final Brexit and, and then, deal... Then, clearly, we want to go on trading with Europe. In order to go on trading with Europe, then there is going to have to be some kind of level playing field. And what Mr Barnier has made absolutely clear is there will not um, 
uh, countenance the idea that somehow we can reduce environmental standards to get uh, a competitive advantage for our goods, so-called eco-dumping uh, legislation. They've made that quite clear that that's going to be a central part of, of uh, the final sort of arrangements and deal. And the European Parliament has come out very loudly on exactly the same subject. So there's a fear that we will do a rush to the bottom on environmental standards, partly to get trade agreements with other countries, and that will uh, weaken our uh, 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 standards at home and therefore be something that is a disadvantage to the rest of Europe. They won't accept that. Hmm. In fact, I would argue that it's going to get even stronger. With what's happening in the current US administration, with a certain bonfire yes, <laughs> of okay. policy that's yes. happening over there, the EU is looking to to the West as well as to us. They're looking to what's happening in the in the US and strengthening in response to it. So the current US administration threatening to pull out of Paris out of the Paris yeah. Accords, out of the Paris Agreement, has strengthened the EU beyond what we might have expected even a year or two ago. And this year in November, the next big COP agreement, COP23, mm. the big um, negotiation, is happening in Germany in Bonn. That's going to be a real flashpoint moment for mm. the EU on climate change, where for political, for at home, for international reasons, there's going to be some very strong language about what is acceptable and what isn't on climate change. The UK is somewhat to the side of that. Who are we going to align with? Are we going to align with a strengthening climate agreement in Europe or with a declining climate agreement in the US. And, and like it or not, then far from taking back control on the environment, as in many other areas, we're likely to become more of a, of a law taker than we are of a law lawmaker. Or the child of two parents who are squabbling <laughs> yeah. over the most important issue of the day, as opposed to a key player within that negotiation. How confident are we? We're, we're coming towards the end here, but, but how confident are we that we will be able to hold or that, 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 that NGOs or individuals will be able to hold the government to the account over the environment after Brexit. Fiona. Well, if we look at the, the history, um, then um, it's not encouraging because uh, before the UK joined the EU in the, in the 70s, um, we were known as the dirty man of Europe. Um, and that was because uh, the extraordinary pollution we mm. were seeing, uh, mm. dreadful pollution of sewage on the beaches. beaches yeah. uh, we were seeing very poor water quality because uh, rivers were dead because people were dumping anything they liked into it. Industries were, were dumping. Um, the, you know, the, the, we were exporting pollution because it, it, the acid rain that was stripping forests in northern Europe uh, was actually the result of coal burning uh, in UK power stations. Um, so so we, were, we were not only poisoning our own environment, but we were destroying the environment of other parts of Europe. Um, and it was membership of the European Union um, that took uh, took us into a clean-up, um, a clean-up that took decades uh, but has been very successful. Um, and really, I think people have forgotten uh, that, that process and how difficult and painful it was um, and how easy it would be to return uh, to some of those awful conditions. Tom, is that, is that progress really at risk? Uh, I think it is at risk. I think this government has already made clear in a number of things it's done and not really been held accountable, that it's not keen on having strong environmental legislation. It's weakened the access to a judicial review uh, for people. It's made it more expensive. It's gutted a lot of the planning constraints that were available. It's reduced the independence of agencies like uh, the Environment Agency and Natural England. So it doesn't inspire confidence. But I am a bit more confident in the British people. The British people did not vote to lower their environmental standards by leaving the EU. And if the government doesn't sustain those standards, then my guess is it will, in time, pay quite a big price for that. Solita. I agree entirely with Tom and Fiona, and I just want to bring a little bit of a, of a tiny silver lining to this <laughs> overall cloud, which is, I agree as well, 80% of the British public in a survey done by Greener UK said that they expected to maintain or incre indeed increase environmental legislation in the UK. There is a 
generational shift that has happened towards uh, we don't accept that our children are going to be living in poorer quality air, poorer quality water, poorer quality food. Now this leaves a massive opportunity. I think we've all come to realise that the black box within which government is setting these new standards is not a black box of super efficiency and high capacity. It's a mess in there. So for those of us outside of government have a massive opportunity to not just criticise size, which we will continue to do. But actually, let's get writing some of this. Let's make some recommendations. Let's put forward not just what we don't want to happen, but what we do want to happen. There is perhaps a chance that at the moment, the government may be grateful for those who are prepared to solve some of these problems for them. Note of optimism to finish on. Thank you very much. That's about it, I'm afraid, for this week. Um, my thanks to Fiona Harvey again, uh, to Solitaire Townsend, Tom Burke, for joining me today. Please do subscribe and review on all your favourite podcatchers. Join the discussion on Twitter. If you want to get in touch about Brexit, it's Brexit Podcast. That's all one word, Brexit Podcast at theguardian.com. And if you'd like to review the pod and be in with the chance of featuring in our weekly podcast column, do please email podcast podcasts at theguardian.com. So that really is it. Till next week, I'm John Henley. The producer was Rowan Slaney. This was Brexit Means, and thank you all very much for listening. Listener.